Hey, what's up, everyone? Happy Friday. Matthew Encina here on the Future Academy live stream. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Where are you all tuning in? Let us know in the chat down below. But uh, I'm very excited for this episode. We have uh, a very special guest, uh, Peter Pack, who's going to introduce himself in a moment. And we're going to be sharing the process of main title design from the beginning to end, from concept to delivery. And it's rare that we get to see this nice inside look into the process, get to see the ideation and then all the, the development and design work that goes into something so big, like designing a title for a show. So I'm very excited for today's show. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to introduce himself and let us know what he does. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Pack, and I'm a motion graphics uh designer and art director here in LA. And I designed and animated the title sequence for Godfather of Harlem, which received a main title Emmy re uh, recently. So that was pretty exciting. Ooh. And yeah, and today I'm gonna, I'm glad to be here um, with you guys. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about just how this project was developed and how I came up, how I came to that collage design and how um, it was implemented for this project. Yes, fantastic, fantastic. So just so everyone is uh, familiar with what we're talking about, Jonah, if you could uh, play the clip, the title sequence from the show, so we know what we're all talking about here. Okay, so this is the title sequence for uh, Godfather of Harlem. Can you tell us more about it, Peter? Um, yeah, this is, this, was, this is a TV show on epics that stars Forrest Whitaker. And, it's, and the story is about a gangster in 1960s, a real life true hero, um, not hero, gangster, um, <laughs> real life figure that was in Alcatraz for about 11 years. And then when he used to be the, the he controlled Harlem, but then he came back after 11 years. Um, everything has changed. It's the 60s. The civil rights is happening. Um, heroin has entered the community. There's a lot of strife. And it's a story about him trying to, trying to find himself in that world. And um, d especially in this like tumultuous time that I feel has a lot of parallels with what's going on today. Yeah. Dope. Yeah, and people are saying badass transitions that stuff looks pretty <laughs> cool and this stuff definitely has a place in my heart because it, it I, I love this aesthetic yeah um there we we can't we the team at digital kitchen um got together and came up with a lot of different ideas um we pitched a lot of different concepts and I was personally drawn to this concept because it was something that happens in the past. It was when I looked up so much um, reference material during my research, where we'll show you in a bit, um, a lot of it is fo photography, footage. It's very archival, vintage. Um, the images have scratches and dust and texture, and it shows the age of time. And that was one of the the aesthetic that really influenced me to kind of go more towards this uh, 2D flat um, design element mm -hmm. versus maybe more some of the more like flasher, like 3D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think it's very appropriate for a historical piece like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely uh, <laughs> loving that kind of stuff. I just want to give a shout out to everybody who's joining us live, people from Canada. Uh, Guatemala, Colombia, everybody's saying what's up. Oh, people know that guy. I think you got some fans in here, Peter, some homies. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people people are looking at this and they're pretty amazed because when you look at something that's finished like this, when you're watching this on TV, you don't really know how it's made or how much work it takes. And if you are doing things like graphic design or motion design, you might look at that and see this massive gap between your skills and something like that, where it's, it's just, it's gorgeous at the end of the day. So I'm hoping that you can uh, peel back some of the layers and, and share us how we got to that. How do we, how do we get to something like that there? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, should I, should we start the presentation? I'd like to just yeah. start while text is on the screen so that yeah. I'm not just reading it, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, let's you jump know people in. can just look at it. <laughs> they could tune me out and just read this, the writing. Yeah. On the screen <laughs> now let's want. jump in. Yeah. 
Let's see. Yeah. Are we there yet? Oh, yeah, sweet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, Godfather of Harlem, main title development. Let's see. Oh, wait, let me see if my keyboard is working. Sweet. All right. Um, I mean, we're talking about main title development. Um, usually it starts with a creative brief. At Digital Kitchen, Chris Brancato, who was the showrunner and creator of Narcos, who we had previously worked with, came back to us. And Narcos was, you know, such a mind-blowing um, main title, too, when it first came out. And he wanted something that would be similarly ambitious, something that would have a lot of detail and scope. And especially nowadays with, with main titles starting to become a little bit shorter because of the, you know, the people's attention spans, the skip intro button. Um, he thought that going, doing a, a one minute 30 main title would, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be ambitious. So, I mean, he came at us with the creative brief, how God and um, Godfather of Harlem is an examination of a world with deep contemporary parallels. There's a lot of things going on back then that, Ha are that we could kind of see going on in today, um, culturally, politically. There's still the problems of back then, like police brutality, heroin addiction, a divided nation, um, crime. Um, we're kind of viewing and confronting a lot of those issues through the prism of the 1960s. And let's see. So when we when we when Chris when the showrunner, the show people, the client first comes at us with an idea of like, okay, this is what we want. You know, what is it gonna, you know, like, what's it gonna look like? Is it gonna be hand puppets? Is it gonna be flashy 3D? Is it gonna be Lego stop motion? We all have to not, you know, <laughs> those are just some wild ideas, but then <laughs> we have to um, start asking a lot of questions to them so that we have a better understanding of what the material is going to be and what is it that they and what is the story that they want to tell and i listed mm, some five little thumbnails i mean some five little uh questions at the bottom how to position the show how to portray um because i'm talking about the godfather of harlem I'll, I'll be kind of using this as a guide uh to explore these concepts um how to portray the era of harlem how to portray bumpy johnson and the civil rights movement how to portray the evolution of seasons and if you notice there's a lot of how questions you know how mm -hmm. do we make a main title how do we you know develop a concept and you asked you you talked about how do we go from you know how does one go from nothing you know to ending up with something that's really finished. And the, the easy way, I mean, the easy way is, the easy place to start is to ask a lot of questions. The basics, the who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, trying to keep it a lot, trying to keep things simple. It, I think there's a lot of anxiety in the beginning when there's a lot of option paralysis and things can get mm -hmm. very um, stressful when we try to decide and try to make decisions. But I think when we try to focus on these five questions first, uh, mm -hmm. five, counting that they're five. Nope, there's the ones six. Before, yeah. Yes, there's yeah, six. Sure. <laughs> um, see, I can't count. <laughs> um, yeah, um, then it'll help create a, be a better, clear way to arrive at where you, where you end up going. So using this project as a guide for the question of who, um, I, asked, I, asked, I had to ask myself, who is this show about? You know, who is this show uh, being told to? Who's the audience? Um, who are the characters? Um, so coming up with just a lot of, just doing a lot of research um, trying to talk, trying to figure out who the characters are. Um, the main characters of the show, while there are many, is uh, Bumpy Johnson, who is our main character protagonist, anti-hero, who was a mobster boss, but also a family man. He was someone of extremely high intelligence. He was a poet, a chess master, a family man, yet he was also a killer and a gangster. So how does a man that is able to... Um, 
be a family man, take care of his community, how is he able to rationalize um, being a gangster and also a drug dealer who brings into brings drugs into his communities? You know, how does he rationalize that? The second character is Malcolm X, who was a very famous um, civil rights activist and a Muslim minister. And he and the third character is Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was a congressman. And the fourth character is Vicente the Chin Gigante, who was an Italian mob boss. And the show basically explores the relationships of these four characters, some of their, the alliances that they make, the betrayals, and how they're able to sometimes uh, move forward. Because in essence, this show, in addressing the what, is about the American dream. Um, it's mm -hmm. about crime, it's about family, it's about violence, po politics, religion, existential choice. Um, things aren't really black and white. Um, there, every um, time we make choices, it sometimes we have to make compromises. You know, who do we like, even though we might have a lot of people or things that we want to do or protect, you know, some of the times the choices are made for us. Um, so a lot of these um, images that I'm showing up on screen are kind of from my initial research and my mood boards. Um, one of the things you want to do in the beginning to kind of try to get a good sense of what the ideas and visuals can be is to come up with a mood board. A mood board is just a collection of images that kind of re like relate to or something draws to you. It could be the color, it could be the content of the images, just something that you feel like can better help you um, focus on what you want. And let's see, for the question of where, um, this, this takes place in Harlem, New York. It was a predominantly black neighborhood. It, ha it was famous for its nightclubs, its, um, its uh, music scene, but it was, and it was actually very diverse at the time too. Um, a lot of Puerto Ricans, Italians, and black people lived together um, at, in Harlem and within the island of Manhattan. And um, some of the imageries I did research, um, trying to see what, what was the photography, what was the aesthetic, what was the fashion, um, even the colors of the time mm -hmm. that is being portrayed. Um, when, when was, when was a very important question to ask because this is a historical um, bi drama and it takes place in the 1960s. It was when the space race was happening. Cassius Clay was still going as Cassius Clay. Um, there was the Vietnam War happening. Kennedy was president and segregation was very rampant. This was a little bit before the Civil Rights Act was signed so that mm -hmm. um, a lot of the marching and the protests were still happening. Um, why? Uh, the question of why is why could be like, why is this story being told? Why is this being told now? Um, and the answer that I came up is that it is culturally relevant and shows kind of the parallels to the present. There's a Mark Twain qu quote that says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, I'm a fan of history and storytelling. And I, I, lo I love the fact that um, we could look to the past to kind of guide us towards how we should are able to identify ourselves and how we can look and act towards the future. And I purposely um, oriented the images that you see on the screen here to kind of be mere reflections of itself so that it shows that a lot of the things that happened in the past are still going on today. And whether it's equal rights, income inequality, racism or drugs, to name a few, the show reveals how similar and relevant these issues remain to this day. It reminds us that the fight for the American dream is an ongoing struggle and each new generation has an obligation to bring forth positive change. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And people are complimenting you so far, Peter, on your presentation. Oh, Very great you. ideas. It's I nice am to just, see that. <laughs> I'm just staring into space. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good. Yeah, I wanted to give you some feedback as people are saying, yeah. like, these are, you know, really nice articulate thoughts. And then also being able to see the types of questions that you ask and where it leads you to, especially mm -hmm. into 
uh, you know, where we're going to arrive to for the final output of the the design that you make. So I just wanted to compliment you on that and give you some love there. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And uh, be sure to tell me if I'm leaning too forward and you're getting too much of you. Too much forehead? forehead. <laughs> <laughs> now we're good, man. We're good. All right. I got that COVID hair going on. Yeah, so that's right. That. <laughs> All right. Um, so, oh yeah. And then the last question, how? How is the most difficult question? to answer um we have to you know go through all the who what where when why in order to really be able to answer the how and the mood these images are the images that kind of appealed to me in terms of some of the aesthetic the grunge the texture the typography the colors um and what i realized appealed to me was the archival vintage photographic and really tactile aspects of this time period um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of how, and during my research, if you look at uh, what is it? the far right image center, there was this image that is in this page, it's the top left. I found this image. It was the cover of a Roots, of a Roots album. And I did a lot of, and then I got something about it really appealed to me. And then I did more research into where it came from and who did it. And surprisingly, I was just, it just went me down a rabbit hole of just learning and being inspired. Um, and I think in when I wanna talk about inspiration, I wanna talk a little bit about inspiration. Um, how, I mean, and this is my personal attitudes regarding, you know, just how I think and how I design. But I feel like in order to be able to be inspired. Sometimes we have, you know, like a writer's block in our head. We don't know what to do. All, we've scrolled Pinterest for hours and coming up with nothing. Um, to be inspired, we have to, of course, first have a large range of interests to draw inspiration from. You know, try, try to um, be a person of the world. Try to, you know, even if it's just going online, even if it's just subscribing to different stuff that is outside of what you have interest in um, that's definitely helpful but i think one of the most important aspects is to have empathy and what i mean by empathy is um, being able to see through the eyes of someone else it doesn't mean that you have to agree with them it just means that you could kind of put yourself in their shoes for a little moment and be like okay i could kind of see that's where it's coming from or that's how they think or was made. And when you look, so that when you look at different things, um, try look at different perspectives, you kind of try to put yourself in their shoes and see what were the choices that, why, what, what and why were the choices that they made and what are the issues that they care about and why they're, they have, they have, and how they have put that into their art. I think, mm -hmm. um, what is it? There is an issue where I could look at something, think it's great and appropriate it for something else that is completely uh, does not relevant towards the original um, creator. And that's basically cultural appropriation where you steal art and you do it in a way that doesn't respect the original creators, doesn't respect credit or benefit the original creators and further contributes to their marginalization, especially if we're talking about uh, black art or art um, made by marginalized um, demographics. And mm -hmm. I tried to do it in a way that was very um, respectful. I, tr I did it. I tried to do it in a way that would be more of a tribute and pay homage to the original artist, who was Romare Bearden, uh, who created all these artworks and, and tried to do it in a way where I hoped not to elevate myself in the creation of this main title, but to kind of give tribute to the fighters and activists in the past who fought for the American dream. So that when people see this main title, they're not thinking about me, they're thinking about the subject matter, the issues that this show, that this main title and the show sparks and, and also bring light 
and awareness to Romare Bearden and other black artists. Uh, um, yeah, so that, that was my little rant about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's important. I think it's important that um, when you look at stuff um, that you don't just take and just photo bash everything together and steal, steal, steal without, mm -hmm. you know, properly understanding. And I'm very guilty of this. I've done this all of my career. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes some time before you can actually look back in some maturity. Once you've had your own art stolen and your own thing stolen and you look back, you're like, oh, that didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And then you start to realize, you know, the people that are out there, the other hardworking artists. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you, you should pay homage. You should pay respect. And if you are appropriating something, make sure you do it appropriately and make sure that it's, um, uh, that it's it's appropriate for the application, right? Because you wouldn't just use this for just anything, right? You found this very particular thing and it kind of weaved together all of the other research and questions you've asked up until this point. So I think that was a great little rant for you to share with us in the audience. Yeah. Um, and ever since uh, this main title came out, I've had people reach out to me going like, oh my gosh, this collage style that, you know, you designed is great. Um, I would like, you know, can you make you know, use that style for this, you know, sport, high school sports documentary that I'm trying to produce. And when, when people come to me with those kind of questions, it makes me uncomfortable because I developed this style as, an, as paying homage to Romare Bearden, to uh, Black artists and the, the issues that were um, being, that, that are relevant to this artwork. And I wouldn't feel comfortable um, redoing Romare's particular um, style of collage for some other application, you know? And I think that's kind of the difference between uh, cultural appropriation and, and appreciation. Um, you know, we could, we, even though the Black community created hip hop, hip hop is worldwide. And, but that doesn't mean that um, if, you know, a Japanese person loves hip hop, that that's appropriation. I think the level of respect, the level of credit, um, whether it uplifts or celebrates and appreciates the marginalized community is definitely important to how, um, you know, these things should be framed. Um, yeah, and I'll talk, so I'll talk a little bit about Romare Beard and what I found. Um, he was a black artist back then. It, he actually lived in Harlem in the 60s, exactly the same setting and time period that this show takes place in. And he's m most known for his photo montage uh, compositions that used uh, torn magazines, um, different t uh, photographs and textures to assemble um, powerful statements on African-American life. And let's see, we felt um, his art was relevant to the show because it shared themes and portrayals of social inequality and the African-American experience that the show similarly explores. And the tactile and tangible textures of the collage, as well as its ability to present and juxtapose different subjects from different sources within a single composition was very highly influential to this main idea. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is more of the continuation. Um, so I talk about research, you know, luck, you know, purely by coincidence, there was an exhibition called Soul of a Nation, uh, Art in the Age of Black Power, 1963 to 1983. Uh, our show takes place in 1963. And it was touring and in Los Angeles at the time um, at the Broad Museum. Broad? 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 Broad. <laughs> and Broad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No one knew in the beginning, and whoever said they knew was lying. <laughs> and then, um, so it, I was actually able to see that exact artwork up close. The second panel is me so cool. um, next to it. And, you know, I thought it'd be something big, and I was so surprised that it was something so small. But then the amount of, you know, detail that you could see, the amount of textures, the amount of layering. I mean, so all the images from the previous, uh, frame, the previous frame, the previous slide, were actually mm -hmm. all um, images that I took myself with my phone. You know, nice. you could kind of trying to do that research. What does a paper edge look like 
um, when it's torn. You know, sure, I could do it at home, but if I'm trying to um, pay, pay homage to this artist, I want to try to make it at least a little bit closer towards what how he has done in his compositions. Um, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, which is one of the best books I have ever read. I highly recommend this to everyone. Um, the, there, um, Bumpy Johnson, his wife wrote a biography on Bumpy Johnson, and I read that too. And I think it's very important when you're trying to immerse yourself into a concept to really try to, you know, do the proper amount of research um, and, you know, just find out everything you know about it, you know, just, just become passionate. Um, let's see, next slide. And here's an example of some of the ways that, here's one just particular example of um, how some of his imagery influenced other than the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, on the left slide is Romare Bearden's Rocket to the Moon. And it's a collage that depicts people living in the slums. And at first it looks like, when you look at it at first glance, um, the faces are the things that your eyes kind of get drawn towards. And it looks like happy faces and people are having fun. But then you see like, start seeing the grim worried faces of the other people in the collage. You, start, you see downcast eyes, um, eyes that look like they've been crying, mouth that look like they've been um, screaming or crying. And at the top, almost like it should not be there in the red circle, is a rocket ship. And, you know, what the heck is this rocket ship be in this work? And it's a representation of how the country in the past and present spends all its efforts into advances in technology and warfare, all the while leaving the problems of the people that society, that the people of society faces behind. And it's such a simple yet powerful uh, message. And the way he was it, used um, the different, uh, the different photographs, the different materials from composition um, to kind of tell this message, I think was really powerful. And with some of the ways that it made, and I paid homage, uh, homage to it, um, mm -hmm. At the bottom two frames, the the center one was my first pitch frame, and mm -hmm. the the one on the right is the final screenshot. I, it moved over to that different uh, scene, but that's kind of one of the ways that it came into the main title. And mm -hmm. you know, this was this is such a powerful statement because during the 1960s, you know, of all all the social social, social strife. Um, civil rights happening, yet what was America and the government focused on? The civil, mm -hmm. I mean, not civil war, the civil, um, the Cold War. <laughs> civil war. Right. The Cold War. Uh, the, the, it was the, the race to the moon, right? It was the space yeah, the race. Yeah, the race to the moon, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's just some of the ways how he talked about um, societal issues that people uh, faced at the time. And I thought that that was particularly relevant um, to, for this concept. And so this, this is the pitch. This is the, you know, pretty much exactly how we pitched it. I mean, we put it in a deck where we also included a bunch of different great concepts, um, mm -hmm. but this is pretty much exactly how I showed it. And this mm -hmm. is the little write-up that I came up with. And I talked about how we were inspired by Romare Bearden, how it was relevant because he lived during this time period, and talked about the same issue that the show similarly explores. And there, there was a quote also by Rachel Delu, who is an a US, who is an art history professor. She said, the cutting, fragmenting, and reconstruction involved in creating a collage provides apt metaphors for the trauma and violence of war and political oppression, the evisceration of the status quo, and the piecing together of new societal forms. And that was the quote mm -hmm. that really nailed this whole collage uh, concept into my head that this is the one, you know? Mm -hmm. Because what I really loved about collage is that if I were to take a picture of you and people were to look at that picture, they wouldn't, they would just think, oh, that's him, you know? But if I were to make a collage of 
not just your face, but many different faces, then it is no longer a picture that represents you. It is a picture that represents um, people like you as a whole. So when, I see, when we create collage where people's faces are um, created from different materials, we're not talking about one particular person. We're not talking about one particular Black man. It's representative of all Black men or all Black people. And I think that was one of the ways that uh, collage definitely um, does, we does well uh, mm -hmm. and great at. Let's see. So in the beginning, um, when we do a pitch, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, we do about nine frames. Nine frames is, I think, perfect for um, just getting your idea across. I think mm -hmm. three frames in the beginning, three frames for the beginning, uh, middle, you know, ending. I think nine frames is enough to tell a story. And these are the frames that I kind of came up with. Um, and when I came up with this, I wanted to, the, 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 the thought process in my head was what is the story that we're trying to tell? What are the who's, you know, what is the story? Who is the story about? All the questions that were answered earlier. And let's see, fra the frame one top left, I wanted to establish the setting. You know, it happens kind of in the city, in the urban area. Um, the signage kind of shows. Uh, the signage kind of shows like the city, um, what, what um, were important at the time, or just, you know, just getting the, a feel for the environment. The second, one, the second frame kind of represented uh, society kind of being toward, torn, the society's values being torn um, between piety and um, hedonism, maybe, about pe people that were wanted like how drugs and were kind of entering the community, breaking families and people apart. Mm -hmm. um, the third frame was a frame where I wanted to include uh, footage just to get, a, get an idea to the client, of course, that this wouldn't be all collage. We're also going to include archival footage. Um, so having a frame that includes something like that uh, can definitely help the client understand. Um, let's see. So some of the more signage, some um, to see, what is it? Get an idea of the setting. The middle frame, frame five, talks, you know, a, um, gives a little clue, like little, talks a little bit about um, just the violence uh, in the community, um, kind of hints at the Italian mob association. Uh, associations with this uh, in this story. Number six is about um, box, uh, what is it, a boxer fighting uh, community. And I particularly like this frame just because, um, you know, it's, it parallels a lot of what's going on right now too, how, uh, especially with Colin Kaepernick, people say like, oh, you, you're an athlete. You shouldn't be talking about politics. You know, you should just mm -hmm. play. But here we have an, a boxer who is outside the ring getting attacked by a police dog. And it represents him fighting so society because at the time and currently today, society is afraid of black men. Um, they're afraid of their anger um, um, and at the time, and especially in the 60s, one of the outlets of black men's aggression that was societal, that society approved of was in sports, you know? Um, and boxing, where a man could unleash his aggression and still be, what is it? That was affected by society. But if he were to use his position, his platform, his fame, his voice, to voice the concerns that he has, um, his opinions or his the issues that are important to him, then society tries to uh, you know silence him. And I think that's kind of what that frame is talking about. Um, number seven talked about was it just uh, civil rights and um, crime, protesting, surveillance, just a little bit broad. You know, it's hard to kind of try to capture everything into nine frames. So let's try, try to get a little bit of everything. Number eight is about kind of the protests and the civil rights that were really relevant at the time, includes the little rocket ship on top. top. And then at the end, 
you know, the frame, uh, the logo, Godfather of Harlem. And even mm -hmm. if these nine frames are very, you know, like you, it's very hard to tell a lot the whole story with just nine frames. But if you could condense your ideas into these um, style frames into like a design board, then I think it'll help very get a better idea of knowing what your concept is and being able to better explain to the client or others what your concept is. And the client sees a bunch of other similar um, what was it board boards like this and th th that's that was included in this presentation so sometimes just the look just a couple of seconds is enough for them to know to gauge what their initial reactions are you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so can we pause there because i just i want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is this is beautiful it's great to see this and um uh what we're looking at is just a bunch of style frames that you had composed inside of a pitch and a pitch sometimes you'll present one idea sometimes you'll present multiple ideas like you're talking about but this was the idea that won and yeah. what i like about this is i could see just from sharing all of your previous inspirations all the questions and research you've done how that's manifested in its way here when we're looking at the typefaces when we're looking at the imagery when we're looking at the details of the collage and how you're using smart things like the paper being torn in half representing the community being torn by drugs and violence uh, and then people figures like muhammad ali who at the time was cassius clay and then he became an activist and changed his name to muhammad ali so that how that manifested into the boxer fighting uh, the police and attack dogs on the street like all of this stuff i think is fantastic uh, to be able to unpack and then show in a very condensed way and when you're pitching to clients um, for me, like I, my old pr approach is like work smarter, not harder. So if you could tell the entire story with one style frame, with one image, and you could sell the idea, like that's fantastic. But sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a couple of things like this, especially if there's an evolution of the story of like, here's the setting, here's what's going on. And then here's how things kind of um, evolve in mm -hmm. the story here. And then here's how they all, here's what it all means. So sometimes you do need multiple frames in order to tell that sequence so that when you're explaining it to the person, they can just get it. They can look at this and like, oh, I, I get it. And I can see that. And it's very thoughtful. And a lot of people are complimenting you in the, in the, the comments here about your Thank thoughtfulness. You. So yeah, I just wanted to share that and, and share my thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it really depends on how the client wants, how much and the client wants to be involved in the process. Um, there is there is a step before this pitch which would be presented more like what i showed earlier with the mood boards uh mm -hmm. and and the one frame you know just to get the idea across that way um the client you're not spending too much time on a concept only for it to be rejected right away you know so right. that is definitely a viable way to present if if anything a very efficient way to pre to present um, but yeah, um, I like the, <clears throat> sorry, let me fix this one thing, but yeah, doing, I think one, like whatever amount of frame is able to get your idea across is the best, you know, try just keep it simple. Some people think that they need like 15 frames showing the entire storyboard and sequence or else the people aren't going to get it. They need to mm -hmm. include every great angle, every shot you know, um, that was really cool. But that the thing about being an artist is that you have to make decisions. You have to uh, kind of choose what is the thing that will get the idea across the most efficiently, effectively, and in a way that's easy to understand. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. So after that got approved, um, you know, they told me, all right, now flesh it out. This is a one minute 30 second long um title sequence you know let's let's see what other things that we could kind of try to include um so this was round two of the storyboards uh some things remain the same some things um changed a little bit i included uh you see like at the bottom frame eight you see like an inclusion of some of the characters um a representation of the uh italian mob uh, one of the things that the client wanted to see is the actual um, characters, not just, mm -hmm. you know, abstract representation of the time and place, but 
actually see visually the characters. Um, so that character at the bottom is the actual face of the actual mobster that that the true life mobster um, at the time. And mm -hmm. the little patch right there is a patch from the actor that is mm -hmm. portraying him. So, you know, just a little way of kind of mixing both um, the real and the, the real and Hollywood, um, the past, the present. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, next frame. Same thing for uh, Malcolm X at top left um, and Bumpy Johnson at, at the bottom. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell at the right. And just, you know, just a little bit more development. Um, kind of also want included a frame that didn't make the, act, the cut as a collage about the, uh, the space race. The mm -hmm. astronaut kind of going into his rocket and shooting for the moon while leaving society, you know, behind. Mm -hmm. um, the frame behind, uh, the frame before that kind of showed some of the chaos in the writing. Uh, writing. Um, that didn't make the was it the final sequence because the story took place in 1963 and it was a little bit before all the chaos and and some of the riots happened. So we mm -hmm. felt like that it wasn't quite the time yet to show that. Um, let's see, and yeah, just fleshing things out, um, getting the credits. You know, people really want to know how their names are going to look like. On you know in the main title, you know, is my main name going to be noticeable enough? Is there too much you know background like background clutterness you know that's going to cover it up? Is it only going to be up for like a split second? You know, um, people, it's it's you would you would you would yeah they're they're really that's actually very important. So they want to see important. that in the in the um what is it in the boards, and yeah let's see. So I just I just doubled the amount of frames. Um, to a total of 18 to come up with that. And we also included a frame of kind of showing what our stock footage selects would be because these are the examples of so the collage, like some of the collages, but you could see that, you know, we're going to incorporate some archival footage to better tie in the, his, the, the fact that it's a historical piece um, with into the main title. And, you know, just showing them, oh yeah, these are some of the stock footage choices that we were thinking of. Um, not all made it. Um, the thing about stock footage, especially Getty stock, is that mm -hmm. it is <laughs> very <laughs> expensive. Yes. And I remember um, we, first <laughs> made, we first made an edit containing only stock footage just to get the emotion of uh -huh. the, the piece with <laughs> kind of the music at the time. And uh -huh. while it did a great job of kind of you know, maybe showing some of the, you know, like, em, like emotions, the sense of timing, all that. It freaked the little people out a little bit because they're like, wait a minute, how many stock footages are we using? Because, you know, like, right. yeah, it, it, it could get a little bit crazy. Um, so that's just something also to be aware of when you're making a main title. Try to be aware of, you know, how expensive it could get. Try not to rely too much on old archival footage um, and, mm -hmm. you know, see, you know, and I, and I think those limits actually can, could also help you think a little bit further, you know, push, think a little bit outside the box of how can you get something done, you know, like while, right. you know, having a footage could have been great, you know, I'll just slap it in, color treat it, you know, if we're unable to do that, how can we then get what, the footage would have emoted in a way that, you know, we can, that is, you know, vi totally viable financially. Right. This, right. You know, and there's, diff there's different kinds of stock too. So for our audience who hasn't um, had to license uh, stock footage or photos before, right? If it's royalty free, it's relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost free <laughs> at a certain point, but when you're using, rights manage footage, meaning somebody has the rights to that and they manage the rights based off of your usage of it, where it's going to appear, how long it's going to appear and where it's going to appear, then all of that stuff just drives the price up. So one shot could be $10,000 or 
one shot could be two thousand dollars. It really depends on who owns the rights for that and how they want to um, wheel and deal with you. So yeah. yeah, it can get very very expensive if you're using stuff that is rights managed or and, something uh, that's gonna last three seconds. You know? Yeah, exactly. Or even just a second, or that's blurred in the background. So you got to be very careful with that. And before we move forward, and maybe you're going to answer this already, when I look at your style frames and I look at the proposed stock images that you're going to use, uh, do you guys already know how you're going to use that sequentially, uh, how they're going to animate together? Or this is still just like, hey, we're throwing stuff out there and we'll figure it out later. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of the latter. Um, right. When we... Like here, well, here I, I wanted to, it has a semblance of some order. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to first show the setting, the time period, the environment, uh, kind of go into what people are familiar with. You know, Harlem, it, it has like a nightlife. It has, um, you know, like uh, clubs. But then, you know, there's underneath it all, um, there is, you know, drugs and a split in the community. There is crime, violence. There's also this, um, the whole societal issues that are happening. So when I designed this, I kind of want, did it in a way where we're kind of, kind of just coming, like going wider and wider um, mm -hmm. so that we kind of get a sense of like, by the time that we end, we get, we get a larger sense of what was going on in that time period, you know? So I guess in that sense, uh, I planned kind of the order of how I mm -hmm. wanted to show this. But then at the same time, um, it's very adaptable to changing, uh, restructuring, reordering, um, adding, subtracting. Um, and then at the end, definitely show um, Bumpy Johnson at the end who to reveal that, you know, he's kind of the main character of this show, you know, um, the right. logo at the end. So that's kind of some of the ways that it influences. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, here, here I basically, um, everything that I was talking about, how was it, the kind of the themes that helped me develop a frame. Um, what is the story that I wanted to tell? Because, you know, when we're, even when we, like we got a concept, this lockdown, now it's mm -hmm. time to make more. What's going to happen between this mm -hmm. frame and that frame? What's the mm -hmm. transition? You know, got the process starts over, all over again. You got to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get that, you know, get that anxiety, you know, <laughs> anxiety starts all over again. But then I think by knowing what story you want to tell, and how you want to tell it, it definitely helps me, you know. Would this frame of police brutality have worked if it was all the way in the front, you know? And then probably not, you know. So I think I do like a word cloud, you know, of what are the important things? Um, how do I want to structure it? And I literally, when I created this deck, that's literally what I put there. I put the frames that I already have, but then in the blank squares, I'll just put, I'll just write down space race, you know, um, mm -hmm. police brutality. And I will work with that concept to try to come up with uh, a composition first. Um, you know, if there's been too many close-ups, you know, then it's time to go wide or time to do mid, or those are some of the design elements that kind of influences because these frames don't exactly live in a vacuum. Um, they need to come together as a whole to tell the larger story. And I think that is why we put them in a frame, like in a design board like this, where we could kind of see them all up. Like while we do present them so that afterwards we could see one frame, full frame, um, it's important to be able to kind of just look at it as a whole, you know, even step back from your computer and look at it from like 20 feet away, see what, you know, what are, how, how are the colors looking? How's the lighting looking? Um, they just all need to work together as a whole. And when you understand that, coming up with what you need to tell that story is a lot more simpler. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah. And these are the final, these are the screenshots of what the final um, frames ended up looking like. Um, and that's the thing, in the beginning, things could be very rough. Like, I mean, let's go back to that first, where is it? Yeah, look at that. It's like, mm -hmm. 
everything's a lot there's it's very different from what it ended up being but it's like does 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 it do a job of kind of telling what it can be you know like clients know that um you know whatever is going to be shown is most likely going to be rough and it's going to be go through rounds of revisions and probably get better with production and as more eyes and hands kind of see and touch it but then you know does that initial pitch that wins the you know that will win the pitch does it do a good job of kind of showing what it can be because when someone sees a pitch they don't just want they're not looking at it just to see uh what it is they kind of also want to see what it can be and it's always open to improvement and uh change you know and let's see so yeah these are some of the what is it the final collages how it ended up looking and becoming um and and was it i mean i couldn't have done this by myself uh, my creative director mason was def was um it was uh, what is it very important at giving me um a lot of notes that kind of helped me push myself to um really push this aesthetic to try to make it a little bit better um making me add transitions where i really wanted just to cut you know i'm like i don't have time to make the transition i just wanted to cut right there you know but he's like nope it needs it and i'm like and months later months later i'm grumbling the whole time but months later i'm like damn it he was right you know like it's great you know and, and um you know and, the, and that's the thing about team members uh you don't always have to agree with them but you know especially if you respect them as an artist as a person is something that you want to um you know just try to incorporate a little bit you know and while i did come up with um a lot of the initial designs um it just went through a lot of steps a lot of eyes um what was it geo pan she what oh okay, so i had two other uh junior animators that were working with me um was it geo had just graduated from otis and I saw her at the senior show and I saw that she did some work that did include some collage and told a story about her family and her family from Vietnam and a little bit of her family story and I thought that was really great and when she, when she came to Digital Kitchen I was like yes you know like you know I was like oh finally getting some help you know <laughs> <laughs> and she was uh she was very great at um helping me um design designs things here and there um helping me with animating uh Cisco Torres who was another animator um he came and helped with a lot of the 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 let's say just like little animation elements um creating some of the the reveal mats creating a lot of the textures um um couldn't have done it without without those two helps and let's see Let's see. Yeah, and then these are some of the footage that um the archival footage. Some of not all of them are archival footage from Getty Stock. Um some of them are the show production footage. So we got those for free. Um mm -hmm. some of them yeah, you know, I mean every any time you get a job, you got to ask the you know, the client, you know, what what do we got to work with, you know? Like is this show like already made is there a pilot is there a script can we read the script can we see the pilot um are there any production assets maybe you know like you might not think it might be helpful but hey maybe i could you know it might spur an inspiration or maybe i could use it for a little tiny assets anywhere so you know definitely ask for those things um let's see yeah and then uh i want to talk a little bit about just the overall collage effect you know people when they saw this they were like ah how did you make this you know because uh you know i mean it's collage it's very tactile it's it's you know it looks paperly and it kind of has that like jittery stop motion look i think if we had you know filmed this practically it would have been impossible <laughs> and i probably would have been making it still but <laughs> yeah and then um yeah so some of the so we decided you know i decided that uh what is it it's totally viable 
and efficient to create this entirely in After Effects and Photoshop. Uh, while mm -hmm. some paper elements were shot practically in a live action shoot to kind of um, get some textures or help with some transitions or pieces here and there, um, majority, like 95% of it, was all just After Effects and Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and very simple, really. I mean, to, it's a lot simpler. I mean, you know, as a whole, it's very complex. But to create this effect was actually really simple. And I think uh, one thing I also want to talk about is how, like, I've talked about the schedule, the production schedule for this uh, project before. I'm not sure if some people are aware, but it had a little bit of a longer production schedule than most main titles tend to be. And, you know, it's, it's like no one likes to talk about how long main titles take. I mean, I've, I've tried asking. I'm like, what is normal? Like, it's what I'm doing <laughs> completely janky and like, right. you know, we just wouldn't fly in <laughs> other companies or, you know, but people like, you know, it's just, it really depends on the company and but then um, for this one, I know for a fact that it took a long time because for the longest time, it was mostly just me. Usually uh, main titles have, you know, a team of people um, working on it for maybe like five weeks, um, you know, just cranking it out, you know, making it great, you know, producing, you know, some of the best main titles I've ever seen in such a short timeline. But for the longest time, I think there was a lot of red tape that needed to kind of be addressed include things like the budget things like how much uh money can be allocated to buy these stock footages um mm -hmm. what are some of the rights and um in the middle it kind of was it came to a little bit of a standstill but i think during that time um i took the time to kind of just further ideate and like kind of try to develop the animation and for the longest time it was just me working on this project and right. it was near the end that i finally got uh, cisco and geo's help to kind of try to you know get it all together and try to like do all the gold plating and I, so i think mm -hmm. this project was definitely a little bit different and i don't think and I'll ever work on a project like this again because for such a large project, working on it just by myself, I was like, I'm dying. I need other eyes to look at this. You know, I need, yeah. I'm so limited by my own technical skills also, you know, like um, where, may, like, even if they, even if it's just junior animators, um, they could help with little things so that I'm not rotoing everything myself. Um, I think it's definitely, that's kind of where having a team is very important. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, especially people who are still in school, is that there's, a, there's this um, idea, there's this notion that you can't, particu you can't own a work unless you've done it all start to end 100%, you know? And I think that's a bad notion that discourages collaboration. I think it's totally fine to collaborate with people. You know, you get, you could, you, if anything, in every aspect, it'll make things better. Of course, you know, you got to find the right people, got to have this, the right uh, teamwork going on. But that's just something that I want to tell, especially students. Um, and for artists in general, don't be afraid to outsource certain things. Um, in the past, I had to like roto everything. I had to like do li little things. But then I'm like, no, let's just ship it to, let's just ship all the roto work to a company in India who will do it like, you know, for really cheap or like, you know, just a studio down the road who will do it. Um, and I think dele help, having, um, working, like getting comfortable with delegating certain jobs, uh, will help you kind of focus on uh, what needs to be done and probably and possibly even help you uh, become more comfortable as an art director or a creative director because a lot of creative directors or art directors they start as artists but as they move up to those positions they start becoming more the idea person and less involved 
<clears throat> in the direct application or the direct creation. So it's about kind of learning to be able to be comfortable delegating a lot of the work, yet also having the skills to be able to communicate what you want and how you want it. Um, so yeah, uh, ah, sorry, back to this collage effect. Um, <laughs> well, can I, can I ask a question here yeah. real quick? Um, so I don't think you ever answered it in the whole uh, live stream, but what was the timeline for this project? Because I know you said it started, it had a lull because you were waiting for some answers. And then how long did it take from end to end? Is that three months? It's, you know, I had a Six hard months. time. I tried to actually track that answer recently. Um, one of the reasons why it's also harder is because I was actually working on another project while I was working on this project, like, mm -hmm. you know, balancing things so that um, it's kind of just from looking at the schedule, it's kind of hard to see where, which project I balanced my, you know, balanced my time with. But I did try to kind of look at this question, answer this question. Let's see, let's see. So the pre, the con, let's see. We presented <laughs> the concepts and the design, the initial design forwards with the nine frames on February 1st. Uh -huh. uh, I got the eight, I, I developed and presented the 18 frames at March 7th. So I had a month to do that. And then I had, and then spent three, and then starting from there, it was a little bit of on and off. And then we finally presented the final render at July. So let's say four months, maybe like, which is a ridiculous long time for a main title. But to be fair, you know, a lot of it, what it wasn't time spent entirely on this. And also one of the reasons why it took so long was because we had time, you know, we did this way ahead of time um, right. before the schedule were, was to come out. And mm -hmm. for a huge chunk of that time period, it was just me. So of course, you know, things are going to be created right. a little bit slower versus having like a whole team on it. So, right. you know, of totally course, understand. yeah. And by, and by just me, I mean, animators, of course, there were, all, there were um, producers, you know, work in the, in the background, you know, talking with clients, you know, making sure working behind the scenes, making sure that, you know, things are, you know, chugging along great that, you know, everything's in budget, all that stuff. But yeah, this part, this, like I mentioned before, it did kind of have a particularly long schedule you know, due to those reasons yeah no it's good uh, just because i think uh it, it helps people understand uh how much work it takes uh, regardless of the downtime of how something like this might um how long it would take to, to develop from from start to end and yeah. hearing the people involved a creative director above you you as the main person and then two junior uh designer animators that are helping do uh, a lot of the other work um, it's just helpful to see so that people in their mind can see if I want to do something like this, what would it take? How long would it take? And then mm. how could I play a part in all of this? Because some of the things you identified, especially with one of your artists, which I think was uh, Gio, who was an animator from Otis, mm -hmm. you saw their portfolio, you saw their work, and you saw something in their work that looked related to the thing you were creating. And mm. I think that's one piece of the puzzle that a lot of uh, designers or artists don't consider when they're putting their portfolio together is the thing that usually gets them in the door is when somebody from a company sees work that's relevant to the thing that they're doing. So if you're a creative director and you're hiring out for a job, you say, you know what, I need this piece, this piece, and this piece to solve this puzzle. So you go out into the world and the people that are most accessible, the most the people that are most recommended, and for you that was to go to your alma mater, to go to your school that you graduated from, um, those are the things where you you start first and you say, oh, the square peg is going to go into the square hole, the circle uh, peg is going to go into the circle hole. So uh, to follow up on your advice earlier, because people were asking how do you get your foot in the door, mm -hmm. it's like make the work like the studio you want to apply at. Mm -hmm. If you want to do certain work make your work look like that work. And I think it's as simple as that. Chris Doe likes to say this all the time. If there's a studio you aspire to work at, uh, look at your portfolio and look at theirs and close the gap. That's that's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to be out there. You have to be known and uh, you have to be, uh, the, the more things that help point to you and 
um, recommend you, whether that's an alma mater, your network, or people that you've worked with already, these are all pluses. And then if your work just says, yeah, I'm appropriate for that job, I can plug and play, it's, it's really easy to get your foot into the door somewhere. Yeah, for sure. And definitely um, apply. I mean, just, just submit your portfolio. A lot of the times when it comes down to, you know, we need freelancers, we find that, you know, our book, you know, our freelancer book is highly outdated, or we just, you know, don't really have any anybody. And so it's important to just, uh, you know, just submit yourself, get yourself known out there, work on your website, um, your, you know, get your work out there. Um, for sure, you know, because you got to get noticed first. Um, yeah, and that's how we found uh, Cisco too. We looked at we looked at a list of freelancers and decided on him because I just uh, we decided that okay, like this guy has skills where um, even and here's the thing. Um, Cisco didn't have he didn't work on this type of stuff before. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of like UI designs for you know like little high tech computer graphic looking stuff and. Mm -hmm. You know, even though he didn't work on this collage style before, I knew that we could use him as an artist because his work showed that he had skills in compositing and animating and, you know, design and composition. And it, so even if it's not exactly the type of work, um, mm -hmm. we look at those skill sets to come up with a decision of whether to hire or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure he came recommended in the network because he worked with your, a bunch of your friends over at Cantina, right? Mm. Um, with a lot of alumni that went to your school. So <laughs> you guys can all just vouch for each other. It's like, oh yeah, Cisco, that guy's that guy's good, right? Or so-and-so is like, yeah, I've worked with this guy. So recommendations go a, a very long way for that. And obviously at a certain point, if you're the art director or creative director evaluating some work and you've had your hands on the box animating or designing stuff, you know what good work looks like versus what mediocre look work looks like. So you could just tell, ah, I can bend this person to do this thing, even though <laughs> it's not showing in their portfolio. Yeah. And I think my recommendations for artists who are especially trying to do motion graphics is to be flexible. Um, as an artist, you know, like over time we develop a style, like our own personal style, but if you're too limited by that style, you're not going to get hired by anyone unless they want that style. And if you look at my website, I mean, you could see that um, not through choice, you know, I, I'm working on the jobs that come through the companies, but I, do, I try to develop a design or a style that the project needs, you know, the show needs or the client needs versus trying to impose my personal style and aesthetic onto, you know, the client. And I think as an artist, um, definitely being a little bit more flexible, uh, having a little bit of variety, just exploring different um, mediums, uh, aesthetics um, can, you know, will do a long way into getting you noticed. Because the worst thing, I mean, the worst thing you could do as uh, someone who's trying to get hired is to literally have just pages and pages of work that just looks all exactly the same. You know, I want to see like, and, and even if it's within the same medium, like, let's say you do 3D, you know, like, I want to see a frame that looks that's 3D, but maybe has something that looks like it could be for PBS kids. But then at the same time, you have another project that looks like you worked on Iron Man, you know, or something like just having a little bit of variety that shows me, okay, this person is someone who could, uh, what is it, handle di different types of projects or different types of, you know, whatever the project or client needs are. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that's my advice. Cool. All right, let's get back into this. I, I know we kind of diverged a little bit from the collage effect. I don't know if there was anything else to wrap up, but I think this, I mean, this looks pretty clear to me in terms of the <laughs> steps since you've labeled it here. Uh -huh. right? You got your cutouts and then you just add a little bit of paper details on the edges so it doesn't look so digital. Mm -hmm. and you color correct it with a little bit of uh, toning, right? Making it mm -hmm. warm. And then overall, you just add some nice texture. So it just feels like this was on the photo bed scanner and then maybe it just got all smudged up. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, it looks like you scanned this in or you took a photo of it, right? So 
It's just as a way to make something that's digital feel more tactile and real by using real textures and elements. Mm -hmm. And with collage, um, composition is definitely important. Um, you know, yeah. the it's important because if done wrong, it could come out comical. You know, if mm -hmm. I had this boy's face with like a smile this big, it turns, you know, it, it gives a different mood, a different feeling um, than when it's all balanced and trying to show the emotion or the intent or what you're trying to intend. So definitely composition um, is important when trying to come up with a collage. Um, the technical aspects of how the look was created is very simple. For the paper and edge effect, I mean, these pictures were actually just pictures, uh, what is it, that were digital pictures. And, you know, of course, because of, you know, copyrights, we can't just willy-nilly use any picture from the internet. So we we um, you, we out we used um, either usable stock footage that we got uh, through paying, or from the show that we could use for free, or from uh, free image sites like um, what is it? Unsplash, uh, Wikipedia Commons, some of the really old um, what is it? Govern government like some of the government ones, like right, our free- Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I got, I, got, I got that question a lot, you know, like, oh, what was, you know, how'd you get away? How, how did you, you know, use these images? And yeah, they're all free images. And a lot of these images aren't from the 60s. They're just treated to look like they are, you know? Mm -hmm. And let's see. And the paper edge effect is something as simple as just using drop shadows and rough and edge you know i use i literally use one drop shadow that's white on one side where the light would be coming from to kind of get that white highlight of the paper and another drop sh and then i put a rough and edge rough and edge on the whole thing to kind of give it that little bit of organic look and then mm -hmm. i gave an, a drop shadow going uh black implying the shadow the other direction to, mm -hmm. to you know be the shadow one was the highlight one was the mm. black shadow and that, that's basically it's it's it and then maybe i did it a couple more times to get the give it that extra organicness maybe i you know i might have added another like look like another light source is coming from here or from the other way but that's it's really as simple as that you know like don't really have to overthink the technical aspects of certain things i think it's more important to kind of get the composition, um, what is it, and the framing, like just sticking to the basics, you know, like uh, people, like one of the things about Romare Bearden's uh, collages, if I could go back to some of, to his, uh, if you go to the deck, let's see, let's see, can they see my deck? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so if you look at Romare Bearden's work, it's, amazing and its intricacy and its complexity yet it's just too much you know it's too busy it's we don't have time to look at every little detail um if i put a credit a name over this frame is it going to stand out are people going to be able to read it um probably not so you have to think about um how do you how, what are like how can you simplify it so that you get what you want yet still be able to, you know, incorporate, like be able to do what you need it to do. And let's see. So yeah, and then this is just a page showing some of the paper, the actual practical paper elements that mm -hmm. we did. Uh, Cisco, he um, printed out and then tore some of these, as these uh, papers, um, got some close-up shots of some of the edges, helped us study how they look like a little bit. Um, and for that, uh, for the boxer, we actually used it as a transition where we started off as a full frame of him and started tearing it away little by little uh, to, mm. you know, and then use that as a reveal. And uh, the blue and the black and uh, blue and the green paper in the back is just paper that we use kind of like, you know, like a janky makeshift like green screen that we could just mm -hmm. easily key out, you know, and it was it's really a, and, and technically it was as simple as that but it's when you get them all together and put them in a composition where they work in 
you know, in all the design elements of, you know, composition, framing, uh, color, um, you know, this is kind of what you end up with. And mm -hmm. I think it's important for uh, artists to not feel that initial overwhelming of how am I going to, what, how am I going to make something great from the start? It's about just keeping things simple, asking yourself the questions. Um, what is, what, you know, who, what, where, when, why, how? Like, what, are, what is the story that you want to tell? What are the things that you need to do and get across? And if you just add on to it little by li little, by little, you know, start with nine, fr nine, one, start with one frame, you know? You could research and Pinterest, you know, like, all, like, where you got hundreds of tabs on, which I'm totally guilty of. But at, at, at a certain point, you just have to start, even though you might not have a specific idea in your head. And from there, it's just kind of building on little by little until hopefully you end up with something that you're happy with, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. cool. So I, I think what I want to do is I want to queue up our audience. Thank you so much, Peter, for, for sharing all of that. I'd like to queue up our audience for some questions, and they're asking some good questions now. But um, um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Jonah, could you play the title sequence one more time? Because I think we went through this long, extensive process. And I know we showed the, the title sequence right at the very beginning. And I think it would just be helpful for us, again, to revisit all that reference, all that research, all of those little techniques that you did here and there, how it uh, came together in the final piece because it's nice to see the individual storyboards and how those fleshed out and then now how did they get stitched together especially with the stock footage so just looking at the title sequence now there's some really cool moments where you have all this staccato stop motion animation and then you have an interesting transition like that where it tears away da, 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 and goes back into live action and then live action live action again clips from the show and then you'll have a moment where all of a sudden it's back into the transition of this uh, paper collage look. So it's really nice to see how it comes together and there's definitely magic in there. And I think for me being a motion designer myself, these were the things that attracted me to motion design to be able to have a mixed media approach between traditional static design, between film and video, and then implementing all of these other mixed media approaches all together. And then seeing that all come together, it, to me is, has always been the magic of, of motion design. And it's nice to see things like this and, and, and share with our audience like what the process is like to build something this beautiful and this big. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Nice. That's the, that's the exact reason why I got into motion design too. I actually uh, went to Otis myself as a concept artist, and I took one class, did one painting, and I was like, "Oh no, this isn't for me." And then when I when I took an After Effects class and made a ball bounce, I was like, "Oh wow, like this this is for me." You know, like seeing things in motion. You know, like get mm -hmm. getting you know different being so flexible with aesthetics or materials yeah it's it's great you know i, I love what i do <laughs> that's fantastic and i guess that was a, a question somebody was asking how did you get into uh title design specifically mm. um i mean long story short it kind of fell on my lap just because i worked at digital kitchen who has that has such a big pedigree of working on uh, main title sequences the before my time they made um, true, the True Blood, Dexter, Six Feet Under um, main titles. So mm -hmm. they are they were they were a prestigious uh, company known for um, main titles. So that by the time um, I came to Digital Kitchen, um, what was it like that was kind of the projects that uh, I started getting more and more involved in. Um, uh, I wasn't I was there for the narcos uh main title but then what is it i wasn't on the project you know i was just mm -hmm. the guy next to the guy working on it <laughs> but then i got so, so that was my like okay so that's kind of like you know the, the the pitch that's how it works that's the steps that they gotta do and then you know i started getting more and more into what is it, it into the projects yeah and then so it's definitely I was blessed that I was able to work at such, at a company that had such great uh, opportunities that presented itself to me. And, you know, it's just something that you just have to have a little bit of experience 
um, and grow with. Um, not to say that you can't be a freelancer or a solo artist who can work on uh, main titles, but I think it's just a little bit more easier if you work at a company that does those types of work. Nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to echo what Peter is saying, if you do good enough work, you'll get in the door. And then when you get in the door and you do exceptional work and you do that repeatedly on different things, then you get you build trust. And when you build trust inside a company, they trust you to do more. <clears throat> like for me working for Chris Doe at Blind, I started as an intern, actually his student back in 2006. Then I interned for him. And then immediately after I finished my internship, I started freelancing for the company. And then, you know, over a decade later, it's like, then I became a creative director. And it's just, it's just this a mass of uh, building trust and getting your hands in a lot of different things where my specialty was design at first. And then I became a better animator. And all of a sudden I'm directing the projects. It's like, these are things that you just build up over time and you just do a damn good job <laughs> wherever you're at. So maybe this is a, a, another question here. Somebody asked, what's your favorite title sequence, Peter? Ooh, there's so many. I mean, uh, what's the first I mean, one that comes to mind. All right. The first one that comes to mind is American Gods. Uh, mm. That was just mind blowing. I mean, like in terms of just the scale, the, the colors, the music. I mean, it was just great on all fronts. Um, just the concepts that it was trying to, you know, like, imp like, get across to the like the the mixing of like the religious and the history historical aspects of the story with like the present and you know the technology I mean it was great I remember being mind blown by uh, Game of Thrones um you know, just really good at doing and it just keeps I just keep getting those types of work and I think as an artist it's definitely uh have to what is it? You got to find your, find what you love doing, you know, um, you got, and find what you love doing, um, get really good at it. If you have an interest in doing something like, you know, take the time to just really get really good at it. You know, if you love doing 3d, then just take the time to, you know, just get really good at it. If you love doing after effects or, um, 2d type stuff, or even, you know, collage animation, like stuff, um, just get really good at it because w one of the things that I did when I first dabbled with the idea of doing the collage was okay what collage type animation is out there you know I looked I googled I you know searched Vimeo um, typed in every combination of collage paper stop motion animation and I saw what was out there and I and what is it and I thought how can I do, how can I do it different? How can I make it better in a sense, you know? And I think what really helped, what is it, sell this concept also with the showrunner is that it's a, it's a, it's a look that isn't, it's a look that is fairly, is kind of new, you know? I think there's been kind of a little, there's been a trend in main title graphics where it's a lot of, you know, very, very gorgeous and beautiful 3D, um, a lot of, but then, so, so when the showrunner came to us with the idea that, like, oh, I want something that will stand out, you know, and I kind of looked at, okay, what were the main, like the main, the main titles going, like right now, I saw that a lot of them were these gorgeous 3D pieces. So I thought maybe by making it more 2D flat, um, collage aspect, it will kind of stand out from the rest, you know? So that was kind of just one of the, I, the idea and process that kind of helped push me towards that concept too. And the thing is, I've never done this collage uh, con animation or design before. Like I've never, um, and that's the thing. I think when, as an, as a, because I'm an artist that tries not to impose my personal style to a project, but tries to see what the project needs, I am always trying new things, you know? I gotta look at, you know, what's been done before. And uh, there's this artist called Blink My Brain. Um, Blink My Brain? Yeah, I believe it's Blink My Brain. Um, Blink My Mind? Blink My Brain? Ah, I'm having a brain fart. But he does the best, I mean, he's, he's gotta be the best 
kind of stop motion collage paper texture animating guy and i was like okay like i want something that looks like that but in you know in my way or in what in the way that kind of works with what i want it to work so i think definitely um pushing yourself to try new things um yeah yeah it's i i don't even know what i was talking about originally but yeah <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I was going to say uh, for for collage artists, yeah, there's there's definitely been a great history of amazing people, and right now my favorite uh, contemporary collage artists and animators are uh, Alice Isaac. She's amazing at what she does. I think she's doing mm -hmm. some phenomenal work. And then another person who's been killing it for a long time is Rough Mercy. So if you see that guy, he's all mixed media, but amazing mm -hmm. stuff. So both of those people, I think. Are, are worth looking out for and if for those of you who are unfamiliar with title design because it's its whole it's its own industry it's a massive industry um and there's a few studios that do it very very well but if you want to look up and go down that deep well of of studying that look up a uh, art of the title.com and you will see the long history going back 40 50 years of beautiful title design and you'll see i to me those are title design are the most intelligent um, uses of motion design because it really takes something that's the concept, the story of uh, a movie or show and then compacting it or giving you a teaser, letting you know what it's it's going to be about. And I, I think there's just so much amazing work that should be celebrated and part of the title is a great place to study that and and, and find some great, um, great work there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just got to find something to be inspired by and as as aspire towards rather than getting dejected and thinking, oh, how will I ever get there? You know, just got to flip that, you know, mentality in your head to, you know, push yourself. To, and it's a lot easier to push yourself when you're feeling inspired and passionate. You know? mm -hmm. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the show here. Um, so I want to queue up our audience for any other questions. I saw some in there, but they were a little confusing to read. There was one specific question, though, because when we were looking at your process, obviously you did a lot of stuff in digital, and then you did a few things practical. But when we were watching the sequence, there was a couple of moments where you saw these white paint strokes that were transitioning or painting scenes on and off. Were those digital or were those practically made? Or how were those made? Uh, I'm having trouble... Tr figuring out what part they're talking about, white strips. Uh, white um, white paint, it was like, it looked like it was white paint and then it was like kind of like rolling up and down to transition from one scene to another. White paint, I'm not sure what they're talking. Oh, you, you're talking about, I'm not sure what they're talking about. But then, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it was all, those things were mostly, yeah, they were all created digitally. The, right. um, some, yeah, just um, using mats. Uh, mm -hmm. Cisco developed some ha uh, mats with half tones that had just mm -hmm. the. If if I were to open up this project, it's just it would just be layers and layers of mats. Like the mats have mats. Um, you know, it's just a process that um, just included a lot of textures, a lot of overlays, um, applied like a scrolling paper, crumpled paper uh, texture. That's kind of like scroll, like just kind of like you know stop motiony stuff, kind of over over everything. Mm -hmm. um, little like dust specks that you, you would normally get from like film. Um, it's just a lot of layers of different um, design elements. Cool. Mm. All right. Uh, let's see. Do you think Canada also has a title sequence industry? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think uh, title design actually exists all around the world in all of like the major cities and even in smaller cities, like for the longest time, there's a company called MK12 that, and they're still around, they have done killer, killer mm -hmm. work, both in title design and motion design, but they're out in the Midwest, kind of in the middle of the nowhere. They're not really on one of these big metropolitan cities yet. They're one of the most, um, long-standing respected studios out there so it exists everywhere and because we're all working from home too guess what you don't mm -hmm. have to be at a location anymore you can be working um remotely and do some fantastic work and i know a lot of designers and uh, art directors and animators who are working remotely on these types of things but there are a few studios to name digital kitchen being one of them uh, imaginary forces being another one uh, Elastic has been doing a lot of fantastic work for mm -hmm. HBO and Netflix. 
And are there any more that come to mind for you, Peter? That maybe Did you mentioned imaginary to... forces. Yes. Okay. The yeah. The I gotta do a better job of looking up studios, but definitely you you imagine. Yeah, oh yeah, that, I, yeah. I have, I have a friend, uh, James Robertson, that works there. Uh, Harshit uh, Desai. He is a creative director at um, Imaginary Forces. He was the one that I was talking about that was working on uh, Narcos. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, it's definitely a tight industry. Um, you know, you start to become familiar, especially you know if you're in LA. But there's no reason to think that it has to be only LA. Like wherever there's TV and movies. You know, it could be Korea, like there's going to be some company mm -hmm. working on it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Um, one last question here, and this is from Shamari. She's asking, what's your favorite part of the process, Peter? Ooh, my favorite part. My favorite part is, mm, it's actually kind of in the middle <laughs> where you know what you want to do and you're just, all you know that to, to move forward is just effort, you know, just chugging along, putting that man hour um, in. Um, I, as much as I love, love, love uh, designing, coming up with concepts and exploring ideas, you know, which is a close second, there's also a lot of like, ah, you know, like, what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> that, you know, I could sometimes do it out. Um, I, I just love, uh, ooh, yeah, good question, actually. I, there, I just love, uh, like once the concept has been approved, how do you produce, like, how do you manage it? How does it, uh, like, what's the production pipeline? Uh, I actually really enjoy uh, kind of thinking about that. Um, mm -hmm. Like if one of, the, one of the ways I did this project was making sure that it was modular so that each scene was its own After Effects project so that at any point, uh, me or one of the other artists can just open up an, af an, an After Effects and work on a scene without affecting what someone else is doing on another scene. Like if this whole project worked on one After Effects and, you know, someone comes in on the server and starts working and saving over what you're doing, that's a nightmare, you know? So mm -hmm. kind of figuring out that pipeline, making things, making sure things work, organizing um, just everything, you know, like, Maybe it's just a little bit of OCD that is a little bit gratifying when everything goes smoothly. You know, I enjoy that process. Oh, you're not alone there. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things too. <laughs> Pipeline and production and problem solving and making. Oh yeah, problem work. solving. Yeah. Building the machine to make it all work so mm -hmm. everybody can do their job. That's also, for whatever reason, I enjoy that part of it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up our discussion. Peter, if people want to find more of you and look up more of your work and get in contact with you, where's the best place they could find you? Uh, best place they could find me is probably through Instagram. Um, my Instagram uh, hand name is just Peter P4K. Uh, Peter Pack is my name and the A is in my last name is a four. So Peter P4K. Um, and I'll, and that's also my website, peterp4k.com. Um, I ha you know, you, you could, I'm, I'm checking though, I'm checking uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, you know, could email me. That's also my email, peterp4k <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, 